Uh, and Kirsten Green, she's the founder and managing partner for Forerunner Ventures. Um, that's a three-year-old venture firm. Um, and they've got a $40 million fund under management, and they do investing in many uh, next generation e-commerce companies like Birchbox, Warby Parker, uh, Wanello, Bonobos, a lot of those firms. Um, and uh, Jess Lee, she's the co-founder and CEO of Polyvore. Um, it's a five-year-old uh, social shopping site, which I've used many times. Um, and they have a community that clips and makes collages uh, of clothing and home decor, most recently. And um, they have 20 million users per month. And um, Alana Stern, uh, she's the founder and CEO of Weddington Way. That's a two-year-old um, uh, bridesmaids online uh, site. It's a community site. Group, group shopping. Group shopping site. Um, so today we want to talk about um, how kind of design e-commerce has emerged um, and creating that emotional experience that we've been talking about all day. Um, so I'm just going to kind of throw this out there. How has the importance and role of design evolved in the e-commerce space. Whoever wants it most can grab it. I, think, I, I actually think it's the backbone for this whole new generation of e-commerce companies. Um, if you think about sort of what I think of as the first generation, which is Amazon, eBay, those businesses were really founded on the basis of closing a transaction. And most of the process was all geared towards that. And as, as technology has become more advanced and we have more ways to interact with it, um, and it's more of the fabric of our lives. It's just led to more opportunities to use it in a really dynamic way. Um, and so now um, commerce companies are able to really create experiences for their consumers. So it's as, you know, ultimately it's about closing a transaction, but there is a path to closing a transaction that has become a dynamic, engaging experience, which is part of the journey to build loyalty and to really create a brand and have that halo with your business. And in some of your investments, like uh, across those what, f five or six companies, um, like how has kind of design led the way through those companies? I think that it's 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 fundamental to who they are. Um, many of them um, really were founded on the premise of we want to build a brand. How do you go about building a brand? And going about building a brand is very closely related to focusing on understanding your customer and developing a relationship with them. And part of developing a relationship is creating an experience. And so that is the DNA in which they think about creating a business. Um, and technology and, and all of the digital devices and tools is a way of bringing that to life. Yeah. And you guys are building brand new e-commerce brands kind of from the ground up. Like, how has that been experienced in, in turning to design? So I think that one of the biggest shifts that's, ha that's happened with um, e-commerce and, and social commerce has been the a shift in the design patterns from search to browse. So it used to be if you're trying to buy a camera um, or computer, you know what you're looking for, you type in a search query, you search for camera, and then you filter by megapixel, gigahertz, and then you end up with search results. And that pattern's been around for a very long time. You know, Amazon started it a long time ago. But now as more lifestyle products are moving online, like fashion or wedding or um, uh, buying a sofa, you buy those based on your taste, and you buy them not because you need them right at that moment, but because it's fun and it's 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 a it's a pastime to just shop and browse those items. So, uh, I think that's one of the biggest design shifts that we've seen, and it's it's certainly true of of, of Polyvore. We're very browse centric. What are some of the biggest tools you're using to create those kind of emotional e-commerce experience? You know, personalization, mobile, social. What are, what are the main strategies you're using? So I think at Weddington Way for us, uh, the co two core tenets are both social and personalization. So from the perspective of social for us, we have a group of friends coming together around one of life's most important events. So there is natural, it's a naturally emotionally driven experience. And so creating a really robust environment where they can all come together online, collaborate, discover, and transact. Um, sort of builds on the natural behavior that we've seen historically in this group of friends. And so that is where we see really, really high engagement, really, really high customer happiness. And then from the personalization perspective, it's all sort of, we say it's data-driven personalization. So we have a customer who comes to our site for our brides, for example, we know her wedding date, we know, um, we know what color she's been looking at, what merchandise she's been browsing, how many people she has in her showroom, how many people she's involving in sort of this process in her wedding. And so we're able to create really tailored communication and experience
experiences to exactly what she's doing. And we found that to be really powerful in sort of playing with sort of her emotional heartstrings and, and creating an experience that really resonates to her and her specific experience. And you're creating, I mean, there there aren't bridesmaids really communities. I mean, maybe some some kind of like online um, like question and answer type thing, but there aren't kind of these end-to-end -end services where you buy the actual um, clothing and then you manage it online, so you're kind of creating a whole new category. Yeah, it's a whole new category. It's, it's friends coming together no matter where they live to shop together online, to share an experience, to go through the sort of experience from discovery through to transaction, which is just totally different than, than anything she's been able to do elsewhere. And you're using a lot of data, I'm sure a lot of your companies are, and you, you are as well. Like how do you, what type of data do you bring in, and how do you use that type of data to personalize the service or, or offer them better, more products, better experiences? So for our customer in particular, um, I think what's really nice for us is we start with a very high, highly qualified lead, for lack of a better term. She's, she's a customer who's very discoverable. We know where she is. So. Um, you know, whether it's certain blogs that she's reading, certain even magazines still that she's reading, whether she's on Facebook with her status engaged, or there are a number of different ways in, in which we're able to know sort of exactly where she is in her life stage. And so that helps us bring in just a very, you know, qualified customer. And then obviously word of mouth in this space is huge. So with that as a foundation, then through how she engages with our site and through what she shares with on, us on her site, that's where, or on our site, that's where we really are personalizing the experience. So it's a lot of the data that we're actually collecting as she moves through the experience that lends to the personalization. Jess, yours is based heavily on data, right? Yeah, yeah. So um, with, with Polly, our goal is to help people discover and shop for things that they love that cater to their taste. So what we need to do is understand what people's taste, what, what, what is their taste, what is their personal, taste is very personal, it depends, like I might like, you know, this particular leather jacket, but it's different from that one, and it's very, you know, a very specific taste. Um, so to understand that, we have tools that let people mix and match their favorite products into sets, in their collages, it could be outfits, it could be mood boards, but every set is essentially a really unique set of data about products that go together. So we know that this leather jacket matches a particular shoe, though those brands go together, that that trend is rising in the first place. And so we, 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 we have this really unique data set about um, taste in fashion and home decor, and, and the goal is to use that to power a really amazing shopping experience. And you can see this in Bollywood when you click on the, uh, our products and you look at the product recommendations. Um, a lot of that is based on interesting taste data that we have. So it's a very core part. I think you hit on like taste data and um, design. Those are two really important parts of, of what we do. What about for your portfolio companies? I mean, is this data something that when you see kind of the business plan they come in, you're like, you know, that's the way? I think, I mean, I, I think unlocking data and using it to your advantage is, is one of the most exciting opportunities within these companies. And um, if it's done right, you've really made some fundamental shifts to the business model. Um, because these you know, direct-to-consumer brands now have visibility into understanding where their customers coming from, how they found them, how they came into the site, what they did while they were there. Um, as Alana was mentioning, all of that creates this you know, information map about the customer, which then the best companies are able to use um, to their advantage around planning their merchandising strategies, planning their other marketing strategies and programs, and even planning their inventory. So I think you know if you're actually tapping in and using those to your most advantage. You're creating efficiencies and all of those core kind of expense opportunity, you know, items in your business um, and creating a better experience while you're doing it. When I think about kind of two e-commerce giants, um, the transactional giant that you were talking about in the beginning, like an Amazon, um, and then um, a kind of more modern uh, company that is using that more of like an indirect um, type of e-commerce browsing and is a Pinterest. Um, how do you think these kind of, these two companies are still shaping the way you run your businesses and kind of the future of e-commerce? I mean, I'll, I'll just I'll lead by saying you know, Amazon is a is a formidable company. Um, you know, they are impressive in every which way. And as an investor, um, we're always you know being being challenged to try to make intelligent decisions of early stage investments. And one of mine starts with, I like to stay out of the way of Amazon. <laughs> because it's already hard enough to get a business off of the ground. And if you think you're going to compete with Amazon, like it's, 
that much harder. Do you so, think Amazon can compete on that emotional experience level? You know, they, I don't. I don't think they have. Yeah, me too. You know, I think what they've chosen to compete on is certain elements, you know, assortment and choice and convenience. And those have proven to be really powerful drivers for a business um, that has served them well for a decade and will probably serve them well for another decade. And, um, and that is important in certain categories of shopping. And in other categories of shopping, the, the romance of the process um, and the experience you have is a lot more important. Um, and so I think that there are certain categories where Amazon might win for a very long time or always, and there are other categories where it's, it's not the ideal yeah. setup. I was in New York recently, and um, all the cabs and bus stations have a uh, Amazon.com slash fashion ads everywhere. Um, so it's clear that Amazon's really investing in this space, but I think what's difficult is, you know, they're great for the I need to get something, I need to get in and out, I'm gonna do a search, I know what I want, I'm gonna filter, I'm gonna find it, it's gonna be super convenient. But the emotional part of uh, shopping is, is pretty absent from Amazon right now. And I think at the crux of that is understanding people's taste, what's gonna, you know, and Amazon is actually very good at data, but they don't have that data. And I think in order to understand personal taste, you actually need a community. To get that taste data at scale, you need a community of people who are constantly telling you, this is hot right now, this is the trend that's in, these things go together, and without that community, you can't get access to that taste. So you need a community of tastemakers. Do you think Amazon would be interested in that space? Like, do you feel like, oh, maybe I'll, you know, try to help sell some of these companies Amazon? Do you think they <laughs> want to get that space? Yeah. I mean, they're yeah, I think they're interested in, in every space, yeah. as you can already see by the way that their business is evolving. <laughs> um, in terms of Pinterest, I know you were saying a lot of um, kind of the leads on the bridesmaids dresses kind of come from that area. How has that shaped your company? Yeah, so um, Kirsten and I were talking about this before actually. Uh, Pinterest is an incredibly important medium for our customers to, it's, it's where they go to find inspiration. But what we've found is the mindset of our customers a bride on Pinterest is very different than the mindset of a bride on Weddington Way. So when she's on Pinterest, she's in this very blue sky mentality, pulling, um, just driving inspiration from different places and trying to create a vision for this event that she's working on. Whereas when she comes to Weddington Way, it's much more transaction oriented. She actually has a goal that she's trying to accomplish and she needs to find certain merchandise, bring people together, and, and get a transaction going. So everything that we focus on in inspiration is much more um, driven and directed towards facilitating that transaction and that, that mission that she's trying to accomplish on Wedding Two Way. So it's, it's very complimentary in that um, once, once, when she comes to Wedding Two Way from Pinterest, she has a clearer vision of what she's looking for, which means we can also get her more quickly to what she's trying to accomplish. And you do that type of more browsing-based type of experience, more like a Pinterest, less like Amazon, right? Yeah, but our experience is, is quite similar. Um, if you go to the women's sex, uh, fashion section on, on Pinterest, you'll see quite a lot of Polygore content, and people discover Polygore outfits that way, and then end up on the site. Because um, uh, we're, we're is much more focused on uh, actual shopping. And e-commerce is kind of a notoriously difficult business to maintain growth continuously. Maybe you disagree with me on that. No. Okay. <laughs> um, you know, and, it, and it's seasonal at sometimes, and you know, things go in and out of fashion. Flash sales, for example. Um, you know, Fab has been in the news a lot lately. Um, how do you kind of maintain some kind of steady growth, or how do you recreate the experience and involve it to keep your customer? going, keep them maintained? I guess for the entrepreneurs, yeah? Yeah, I mean, it's um, definitely, I think for for Weddington Way, it's a matter of always, it's, it's the design thinking. It's always going back to your customer. For us, it's going back to our customer understanding what she's trying to accomplish, what barriers are in her way, and creating the best experience for her to get to her goal, and sort of staying ahead of her in terms of anticipating her needs, and. Um, leveraging intuition to, based on an understanding of our customer, to try to sort of get ahead of her and, and bring, bring new forms of discovery and collaboration to her um, that, that wow her and sort of answer that, I never knew I needed this, but it's so much better this way. So for us, it's, it's really about the customer-centric thinking and staying, staying true to our core. Um, yeah. Okay. Ha okay. 
I, I, I agree. The fundamental thing you have to do is delight your user, right? And then that, that generates word of mouth. But the, the thing you can do on top of that is be very scientific about um, working on that growth loop, that word of mouth loop, making sure that uh, your users can share the content that they're creating to all the major social platforms, to Pinterest, to Tumblr, to uh, Twitter, to Facebook. So we've been quite scientific about that, as well as you know, SEOs and other growth loops. So all of those things. But the world's going mobile, so it's everything's changing. <laughs> yeah, let's talk about mobile. I mean, how is it, how important is it for your business? Go ahead. I think that's <laughs> really important yeah. in general. You know, I, I think that it, an underlying core truth of this whole segment is, is that the consumer's in charge and that you really need to be wherever the consumer is. And the consumer is everywhere. And, um, and they are increasingly on their mobile devices. So being able to address them in an appropriate way in that um, space in that venue is really important. Do you find, like, is there a growing percentage of your users are just coming on strictly mobile? Do you have any data or anything? Yeah, we definitely, I mean, we definitely see continual growth in the percentage of users coming from mobile. Um, for us, what we actually see is our users will jump back and forth between mobile and desktop a lot. So they're, um, she'll sort of, she'll consume a lot actually on on desktop and tablet, but she's very transaction driven when she's on mobile. So she's either typed in weddingtomway.com for a specific reason, or she is clicking through from a wedding to wait email or an SMS, and she's actually going to the site for a reason. So that's how, so sort of we think about what she's trying to accomplish from different perspectives when we're thinking about mobile design versus desktop. Um, for us, we, what we found is that our mobile users are more engaged. So they spend, I think, three times as long using Polyvore on the phone, um, in our iPhone app, versus on the desktop. Um, but the transaction rates for us are actually uh, higher on, on desktop than on mobile. We don't, we don't sell anything directly. So you have to click through to the merchant site. And many of those sites are not as mobile optimized. And then it's, you know, it's annoying to type in your credit card number on the phone. Yeah. Um, so we found that the transaction rates are higher on uh, desktop. And she spend more time on mobile because she's out. Browse. Yeah, you know, you're, you have that with you all the time. It's fun. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. Browse through, look at, look at some styles. Yeah. How do you think the online and offline experience of e-commerce has evolved? So, you know, you go to the store and you're using your phone constantly to check prices on the things in the store. And then, at the other hand, you know, Warby Parker, you know, online brands will launch a brick and mortar store only. Um, like, what's your, what's your perspective on that? It's very connected to the last comment I made, which is that the customer is leading the charge and they are everywhere and they want you to be able to address them when and where and how they want to. Um, and so I think that um, retailing and, and brand building and product building um, is just, it, it ultimately needs to be a 360 degree experience. And that might mean something different for a Warby Parker or a Wedding to Play. Um, but I would say most, most um, retailing platforms probably have some element of how they can touch a consumer in an offline capacity. That's just an important part of closing the loop on that experience. So are we going to see any poly, poly war or wedding way stores out there? <laughs> um, we aren't planning to sell anything ourselves, but you know, <laughs> we have done a, you know, a couple of events and things with community members. And you have, you have a built-in um, physical presence because you know, they're, they're getting the dresses and they're, they actually have the wedding at the end. So. Right. Yeah, so we definitely were very thoughtful about, I think one of our theses is just we're going to win with our customer in the unique and innovative ways that we combine technology and touch to delight her beyond what she would ever experience in a pure brick and mortar or pure online. So we definitely think very much about how we can touch her and ways we can access her physically as early as possible. So like even in the form of, um, for us, fabric swatches. So we ship out fabric swatches pretty early on and it gives her the ability to have that tactile experience with our product to understand what a color looks like on the screen versus in real life. And it's, the on, uh, it's an opportunity to send a handwritten thank you note. Um, so it's really just building that relationship with her very early in her cycle with us. What are the biggest lessons you've learned with creating the experience with your customer? Um, I think it's for the entrepreneur. Biggest lesson? Yeah, what are, what, are the, what are some of the biggest lessons? What's the most important thing you've learned? Or if there's like an anecdote where no, I, I had this aha moment, I really <laughs> needed to create that experience, 
or, or I did a really good job on this? I mean, I think one thing that's been confirmed over and over and over is you really have to delight the user. Like, you really have to build something that they want to tell their friends about. Like, Polywar has grown almost entirely off the back of that um, through our core creators who really love the site and who we, we, we really try to go the extra mile with our community managers to make them understand how important they are to us and how, because you know, Polygore is really just technology and a platform, kind of a blank canvas. Without our user community who's very talented um, and has great style, we would literally have, not, we would have nothing, right? So making sure they know how we feel about them. You know, we, we send handwritten notes. We, uh, this Friday we're flying out a couple members to, well more than a couple, 13 members to come visit us at, at um, at the company and to see those stories and those people in real life and how much the site means to them, it's, it's incredible. Um, and then what happens is those people go and they tell their friends, they, they, you know, we've grown through people posting their content to Facebook, to Pinterest, to Tumblr, um, through those people guiding the other community members to create the right kinds of content. Um, they also help moderate the site, but literally we'd be nothing without them. So that, that's always been a very important lesson. And it's really great when they, we actually meet them in person and to hear the story and how some of them are even um, you know, going back to school for graphic design or fashion design or starting their own jewelry line. Those are really amazing moments, some of the most rewarding moments. And you're unique because you are actually a user, right? So <laughs> tell yeah. them the story. <laughs> um, so I, I started out as a user of, of Polyvore. Um, I was a PM at Google at the time and uh, someone showed it to me and I fell in love and I wrote to the original co-founders and said, hey, I have all these suggestions for what you could do and then they wrote back and said, why don't you do these yourself, why don't you just join us? <laughs> um, so that's how I ended up in Polyvore. Yeah. What about you, the, the biggest lessons you learned from creating that experience for your customer? Um, I think there's a lot of consistency, uh, the customer centricity and really thinking about how we delight the customers. I mean, wins for us, you know, there are elements of growth and word of mouth and all of that, but we see we have a stylist team that is sort of the customer facing piece of our company, so where the personalized um, the data-driven personalization needs human touch. Um, they're getting invited to weddings uh, of our customers and stuff, so really thinking about how we're building that emotional connection. Um, and then again, the, the technology needs touch is really huge for us. So it's always thinking outside the box, and it's not limiting our experience to exactly just what's happening on the website, but it's really about imagining her experience end-to-end -end. Um, and where she's at emotionally throughout the process and how we're touching her both through our site as well as physically. Um, so really sort of understanding the roadmap of her experience and getting into her shoes um, beyond just the site is really, really important for us. Um, I'm going to open it up to audience questions. Uh, wave your hand if you have any questions about e-commerce experience and design. I've got my own questions. But raise your hand if you, want, if you have any more questions. Um, I have one for Kirsten. From a venture perspective, um, what are the types of kind of disruptive ideas in this space that you're looking for, that you're looking at out there? Um, what, what can I kind be of think about it from still? two two perspectives. So one, um, if you're talking about a direct to consumer experience, either around bringing a new product to market or a retailing opportunity, you know, think about categories where there are big tailwinds. Um, and so, you know, either either there's a positive trend towards people kind of jumping onto the wave of that category, like beauty, like outdoor recreation, sports. Um, beauty and <coughs> Zazi, right? Zazi, Zazi, yeah. Zazi. Um, or, uh, you know, so some, some sort of tailwind in the category where they can leverage all of these new tools to really bring a more efficient business model to market. I think there's still a lot of opportunities there, and those are kind of, you know, they're, they're one-off. I can't sit here and say there's a big theme. It it's really starts with an entrepreneur who has, like, an authentic point of view around an idea and really is in touch with his consumer and has a point of view on how he's going to bring, he or she's going to bring that to life. Um, some of the big trends that I think have you know, underlying um, ties to technology or anything, and we've talked about them a little bit today, but anything along um, the lines of discovery um, and personalization. So discovery is, I think, the direct result of having just consumers are being bombarded with so much information and so much newness and so much product. So you know, how do they go about kind of figuring out what they really do want, what they need? Um, and 
then obviously this personalization thing has come up. I think there's a lot of opportunity for innovation around that that just creates a more dynamic experience and ultimately leads somebody to a transaction and leads somebody back to another one. Are there any um, tra traditional uh, brands that you think are doing a good job? Are there any like, kind of the kind of brick and mortar stores that you think are still are doing a good job um, incorporating these experiences and, and, and becoming more um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a great question, driven. actually. For me, it's been like really interesting to kind of see the evolution of that um, start to take shape because I've been following this space for nearly 20 years now, and um, there's a lot of retailers that have been companies at scale for a decade or two decades, and they're kind of past the prime of growth. And I think that, you know, a handful of years back, all of this stuff that was happening in the digital world was this stuff happening in the digital world. Um, and slowly but surely, it's started to catch people's attention, and now we're at a place where we get phone calls from Staples or Home Depot or these big retailers that are like, we really want to make sure that we understand where the consumer's going and where the space is evolving, and while our business might be intact today, if you look down the road five, ten years from now, the consumer that's going to show up with more purchase intent and more dollars has been trained and grow, grow up in a different way, and we need to understand how to interact with them and how to incorporate that into our business model. And um, you know, some of them have the capacity to be innovative, but like happens in most sectors, um, the companies that are large and the scale and mature, they're not hubs for innovation. So they look to things like our community and startups for accessing that. Have the capacity to be innovative, but like happens in most sectors, um, the companies